Hey guys, my name is Aiden Mattis. I am a master's student in medieval studies at Bangor University in Wales, United Kingdom. Um, currently in my apartment in Pennsylvania, United States. Uh, and I'm going to be talking to you about a conspiracy theory that I have developed um, regarding the National Park Service and a certain creature that uh, is common in Native American folklore as well as early colonial folklore um, in the United States and North, Amer North America in general. Uh, Canada and Mexico have their own legends, um, and I firmly believe that there is a reason for that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into that. Um, reason I'm doing this, I, I've never done long-form content before. Um, you know, I've used YouTube sparingly for a couple of school projects in my, my younger days. I say that like I'm old, I'm 23. Um, so, you know, bear with me, I'm doing my best here, but I had a couple of TikToks that went viral uh, and people wanted, wanted more. They wanted a, a kind of like a super cut, a, a longer video where I go into detail on all of this. But yeah, I'm just gonna dive right into this. So I've got, I've got to say the word once um, because I have, to, I have to base everything on that. And what we're gonna talk about specifically here today is the, uh, the Algonquin, the Iroquois version of this, um, kind of like the, the Eastern North American version of this creature which is called the Wendigo. You might also know it as a uh, skinwalker, a flesh gate, the goat man, uh, the rake. There are a, a dozen different names for this, uh, this cryptid. Um, I'm gonna refer to it simply as the creature because I don't want a bunch of Native American curses being just hefted upon me uh, as I do this video. You know, I do live in a nice, a nice little suburb of Philadelphia. Uh, but it's close enough to the woods that I don't want to take my chances. And by no means am I saying that these legends are all exactly the same or that, uh, you know, Native American folklore can just be condensed into one easy, uh, you know, nice packaged version. But I do think that they all probably share a common, um, I don't want to call it a common ancestor, but they all probably share an origin, um, you know, the, a, a similar creature that inspired these myths. That's why I'm referring to it kind of as, as one overarching mythology and not going into the details of each and every one is because I'm not an expert on that. What I am is a, a historian. I look at historical evidence, I look at culture, and I construct a narrative. Um, so that's what we're doing here. This is not my area of expertise, but this is something that I find extremely interesting. And, you know, people wanted me to go into it, so that's, that's what I'm doing here. So I'm going to start off with uh, kind of what what this is. And this creature is a superhuman apex predator that can hunt silently, it can mimic human voices, remain almost entirely unseen, super fast, uh, and they are also solitary, they're very antisocial, they don't hunt in packs. You often hear about it being one individual being that's, that's hunting people. Uh, that is that is responsible for all these missing persons cases and that you hear about in the the folklore of Native Americans and early settlers and all these different groups. So some other common characteristics uh, can, can mimic human voices, uh, can try to mimic human mannerisms. This is usually one of the places where people uh, will, will trip these things up is that they will, they, they mimic humans. They're also referred to as mimics in the South. Um, but they will mimic human beings and they they can't quite do it. They can't get it right. So if you're paying close attention, uh, you know a, a good one will be able to almost fool you. You will you will think it's human until something in your brain, your instincts, trip you up and you go, hold on, that's that's not right. Because it will do something distinctly inhuman while trying to mimic you. Um, the bad ones, you'll hear stories about them essentially showing up and they can only say a few words, it comes out weird, they can't quite get the language across, um, and those are the ones that are kind of more obvious, but you, you get a range of awkward, lilted speech, you know, and a, a poor attempt at mimicking a human, um, all the way through, you know, ones that can insert memories into your, your mind and fool you into thinking that you, you know this person, this is a human being, who you have known your whole life, uh, who came out on that hunting trip with you, and the only thing that seems off is you know for a fact that when you left to go camping, there were five of you, and now there's six, and you don't know which one is not your friend. 
because it's so in your head. It, it does such a good job of fooling you. Um, and that's what makes them so dangerous in mythology is that a lot of the time you don't, you don't know what you're talking to. You don't know what this creature is. Um, you just know that numerically something's off. There were five of you, now there's six. And often the only way to survive that, that encounter is to fool it into thinking you don't know what it is long enough for you to get out of the woods because they generally won't follow into urban populated areas. They don't like being around lots of people. And that's probably because they can fool a small group. But once you get humans into a big group, we're a lot smarter. We're also a lot dumber in some cases, but you're more likely to notice something that sticks out as wrong if there's lots of you. So yeah, anyway, uh, perfect hunters, solitary. These are just some of the common characteristics. Uh, and there is a psychological term for kind of where, where they think that this legend came from, which is Wendigo psychosis. And it's something that occurs when a human being who comes from a culture that does not practice cannibalism, where cannibalism is taboo. So most Western European cultures, uh, you know, most, most cultures that have a degree of urbanization. Um, cannibalism is generally not accepted in uh, collective human society. It only really happens in very small village-sized groups or in desperate circumstances. Um, otherwise, it, it is frowned upon. You know, to the extent that the Celts actually would spread rumors that they were cannibals to scare off Roman soldiers. Um, you know, bit of a non sequitur, but that, that's my area of expertise, is, is European medieval history. But anyway, so Wendigo psychosis is something that occurs when a human being consumes the flesh of another human, uh, and whether it is because there is some sort of uh, protein in human, human meat, or because of the trauma of that experience, those people will begin to crave human flesh. Uh, to the extent that they, they are driven out of society, they are ostracized, they are forced into isolation, and they will go crazy. Uh, they will develop psychosis. The general belief is, among the settlers and Native Americans about these creatures was that what happened when you consumed human flesh was that act of uh, just doing something so incredibly wrong gave you superhuman powers, but it also made you crave human flesh uh, to the extent that you you would go crazy and never be able to live in society again. And that's kind of the, the I don't want to say accepted, but the, the version of it that makes enough sense for people to process it. Because the other option is that there's something off the evolutionary chain that hunts humans and that's terrifying and that's where this conspiracy theory that i have developed actually uh actually comes from but before we get into that i want to talk about um you know human human evolution and how we have innate genetic fears of certain things uh human beings generally do not like heights we do not like being alone we are pack animals and there are some specific traits that if you look at horror whether it's literary or um, cinema or whatever, uh, all over the world, all throughout history, humans are afraid of pale skin, sunken eyes, and long faces. It, and we are afraid of this in, in Africa, in Asia, in North America, in Europe. People do not like creatures that have humanoid features, but are off. They are elongated limbs, pale skin, sunken, shallow eyes, uh, sharp teeth there you know whether we're talking about vampires or um, the, the creature that I'm talking about in North America that I shouldn't name as much as I'm naming it but we're here now um, you know there's I, I'm not big on African folklore but they have their own versions of it uh, you've got a lot of it in Asia in China Japan Korea they all have their own versions of this creature and this is this is my notes because there was no way I was gonna remember where I was rambling on about this without a notepad um, if I do more videos, you will always see me with a notepad. Uh, but yeah, so I think that there is something that deep within our psyche as human beings has caused us to fear those traits, um, to fear the almost human, because humans are terrifying. We are, we are horrifying creatures. We are, 
just these incredibly skilled hunters and were hyper intelligent compared to most animals. You know, human beings are scary. So something that's almost human, just it's a better natural hunter, is terrifying and we shouldn't want to go near it. Anyway, oh my god, my leg is asleep. Oh, I don't like that. So, you know, humans, it would make sense for us to evolve psychologically to be afraid of these, these features. Could it be, then, that there is something out there that either you had convergent evolution with humans or uh, divergent, and it, it was something that was part of the human evolutionary tree way back, and now it's something else? Or was it something completely different that evolved to mimic humans as much as it possibly could? I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I don't know. What I do know is that creatures like this show up all over human history, all over human culture, all throughout the world. So outside of the missing 401 phenomenon, there are more instances that, that make sense here. More things that uh, make, make me question what's going on. Uh, if there actually is some sort of creature. And if it was just recent, I could chalk it up to internet conspiracy theories, just mass media in the last hundred years, hyping up stories for, for clicks and for print. Um, but, but I think there's more to it because there's, and I'm going to go through a, a few quick instances, I'm not going to go too in depth. Maybe I'll do other videos on them, but, uh, of, of other times when this has reared its head specifically in, in, uh, the United States and Canada. One of the most well-known ones is the situation with, uh, feral people in the Appalachian mountains. Uh, these little clusters of, uh, ge it's generally people of European descent, um, who are just, you know, living out in the wild in squalid conditions, uh, and, um, you know, known for, pe people are known to go missing while hiking the Appalachian Trail, and their body parts will show up, and the only thing that can be said about it is that it looks like they were butchered, not, not ripped apart by a wild animal, like someone took, took a knife as if they were carving up a deer and, and killed somebody and, and ate them, um, which is terrifying, but this is something that exists in the, the Appalachian region. And come after me for it, I know a lot of people pronounce it Appalachia. Where I'm from, it's Appalachia. Uh, the Appalachians are right there. They're about 50 miles that way. So sue me. It's, it's not like I'm talking about this from California. Another thing that links in with that, if you've ever seen the Descent movies, these cave systems, and this spreads across the United States, missing persons cases in these national parks will often line up, people will go missing near caves. And the ones that aren't found are generally the ones that go missing near caves. It would make sense for a creature that hunts humans to use caves as a, a base of operations. Something that doesn't construct shelter for itself is going to need to find shelter elsewhere. Uh, and generally, cave systems. That makes sense. Humans, for whatever reason, seem to love caving. I don't get it. I'm terrified of confined spaces. I would never want to go into a cave. Uh, but lots of people like to do it. It would make sense if we like to do it, that the thing that's similar to us and hunts us also likes to do it. That's another other piece is that you've got out in, in these Appalachian regions, in areas with lots of cave systems, you've got people that go missing near caves and they never turn up. Is that weird little cannibal cults or is that something that is hunting human beings? Something bigger than us, something better and scarier than us, uh, which is a terrifying concept because, again, humans are terrifying. To, to go back in time a little bit more, the disappearance of the Roanoke colony is another interesting one. Uh, this was suggested to me as, as a possible incident in connection with the, the creatures that I'm talking about. It's a little bit different because in this case it was an entire colony that disappeared, and there's a lot of other possible explanations. It might be that they moved to another island, it might be that they integrated with local native populations, but it, it is odd that they just disappeared in the way that they did. And just the final one I want to bring up here is the, the Vinland colony that the, the Vikings settled. Um, this was in, in the early 1000s AD. Vikings are one of my areas of expertise. Uh, one of my favorite professors in, in college was one of the foremost experts in the world on Vikings, so I got a great, great education on that. I am extremely grateful for that. This man was a, an incredible teacher. Shout out, Dr. Hudson. Um, yeah, you inspired me to do most of the things I'm doing today. Uh, 
And if you're interested in Vikings, read up Dr. Benjamin Hudson, uh, Oxford PhD. He now is a, a, a professor of uh, medieval studies at Penn State University. Awesome guy, super cool dude. He, he has a Bayou Tapestry tie. Anyway, not to fanboy over one of my favorite professors. The Vikings settled everything. These are people who conquered swaths of Sicily, Spain, the Middle East, or the, in the service of the Byzantine emperors. They became the, the princes of the Rus. Uh, these are people who went and colonized England and Ireland. There is so much Viking DNA in places where there shouldn't be Viking DNA that there is really no argument that this is one of the greatest colonizer civilizations in history. You know, they had an empire that stretched from the, the Russia over to Canada. Um, and obviously it was never really one contiguous empire, but it was a cultural empire, um, a trade empire. And, you know, the Vikings weren't just a, a warrior group. They were very advanced traders. Uh, later on, they became much more focused on, on trade and mercantilism than on raiding. Raiding was kind of the 600s, 700s, 800s. Uh, and then with the invasion of Britain in, in the 800s, they became more of a colonialist, um, you know, centralized state. But my point in that is they went everywhere. They conquered anything they could get their hands on. And the one place that they refused to stay was Canada. And not even like the really rough, cold part of Canada. We're talking about East Coast Canada, you know, for a group of people from Norway, a group of people who specifically these guys came from Greenland. If you came from Greenland and you landed in Canada on this coast that the, it's a forest teeming with wildlife, furs, um, you know, the only population nearby is a bunch of people who haven't discovered ironworking yet, and you're the Vikings, you know, these are people who had the best ironworking, the best steel in Europe. You know, their enemies bought weapons from them because they were so good at metallurgy. Uh, and they wouldn't stay in Canada. If you're going from Greenland to anywhere else on the planet, you're getting an upgrade. In Greenland, they would have food that was so low in nutrients that people would starve to death while completely full. So if you leave Greenland and you go to Canada, there's really no reason not to stay there. And yet, the Vinland colony disappeared. It was there for 50 to 100 years. Uh, as far as we know, there weren't more than two generations born there. And then they just kind of left. And it's not because they respected the property rights of Native Americans. Um, it's, it's not because they were not as strong as the Native Americans. The only evidence we have is that they simply gave up. And the only reason I can think that a people as wildly successful at everything they did as the Vikings would leave somewhere just based on not feeling it is because there was something so terrifying in those woods that they didn't want to deal with it. So that's, uh, that's where I net out on why the Vinland colony disappeared. Um, but yeah, so how does this tie into national parks? Teddy Roosevelt, who is one of my favorite presidents, incredibly interesting guy, uh, you know, war hero, boxer, survived an assassination attempt, uh, you know, took on both the big government and the big uh, corporate trusts, you know, super interesting character in history. Uh, he, he was behind the Park Service, and it initially began as the U.S. Forest Service, and he was, uh, you know, known as this conservationist. He believed that we should be protecting our wildlands. This was at the peak of the Industrial Revolution. Um, and ostensibly, the U.S. Forest Service was created to protect our wildlands, our, what we now know as our national parks. These huge swaths of American forest and desert and just unique American terrain. Stuff that we, we didn't want to have exploited for uh, its resources because then we would lose it. So he created the Forest Service and um, that makes sense, but it's also the perfect cover for a military organization with the purpose of finding these creatures 
and capturing them, hunting them down, killing them, removing them from the area so that people would not have to worry about them anymore. So basically you can, you can create, you can isolate where these things are and then you can say, all right, you know, obviously we can't prevent people from going here, but at the very least we can station rangers and we can have those rangers hunt these things down, conduct rescue operations, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. And so the, the Forest Service eventually grew into the National Park Service. It became a nationwide, a nationwide organization. And, you know, to this day, it, it operates under the, the auspices of protecting our nation's, you know, our, our national natural treasures. Where it gets weird is when you get into the missing 411 phenomenon. And for those of you who don't know, Missing 411 is a series of books by a guy named David Politis. He was a uh, detective and he now focuses on missing persons cases that occur in U.S. national and state parks. One of the interesting tidbits about when he was first getting into this is he contacted the Park Service to ask for a list of missing persons reports. And what he was told was that they didn't have that list. And then they asked why he wanted the list. And when he told them why he wanted the list, they, he was told that he would never get the list. And he was like, wait, I thought you didn't have a list. And at that point they hung up on him. Now, obviously that's weird for a lot of reasons, uh, but the government being weird and hiding things from people is nothing new. Uh, so the, the question is really why? <laughs> why would they be hiding that? Um, obviously it's embarrassing to have people go missing, but uh, people who go out in national parks, they, they know what they're doing. They, they know what they're getting into. They know that these are, you know, dangerous wildlands where there are bears and wolves and coyotes and they, they could get hurt. Uh, so why would the government be so against sharing information if they had nothing to hide? So the, what, what follows there is that they must have something to hide. And so the, the missing 401 phenomenon documents about I think it's something like 1,200 cases over the last 60, 70 years where people have gone missing in national parks and either they have never been found or they have been found in such confusing and improbable circumstances that there is no, no real explanation as to how they got where they were. You know, people showing up miles from where they went missing in terrain they couldn't possibly have crossed, uh, children going missing and showing up 100 miles away completely unharmed, um, people disappearing just out, out of the blue. Like, you know, the, one of the stories was uh, about a group of guys who were hiking and the third guy in the line was checking back on the last guy, the fourth guy in the line every few minutes. And once, look back, guy was there. Look back again, guy was there. Look back a third time, guy's not there. And all they found was uh, his shoes spaced a few hundred yards away from each other and some loose change on the ground where it's, it, it is theorized that something picked him up, turned him upside down, and carried him off. So stuff like that. And you got 1,200 of these cases, uh, which, you know, is, is not an insignificant number. And that's just the documented ones. We're not even talking about the Appalachian region and the Native American reservations where these kinds of things just go unreported. So what do we have with the National Park Service involvement here? We've got a federal organization that has isolated certain regions in the United States and in these regions, there are high concentrations of inexplicable missing persons cases. Um, the federal government refuses to uh, release Freedom of Information Act documents uh, to reporters and investigators. People are denied access to certain areas of these parks that are ostensibly uh, public lands that they're, you know, they're just driving along and suddenly a, a van full of rangers shows up and says, hey, you can't be here, you gotta leave. Um, uh, you know, Area 51 style, you cannot be here and no, we will not tell you why. And these are just in random spots in public national parks. Uh, and then there's kind of the icing on the cake for me is this one instance in, I can't remember specifically off the top of my head if it was the late, seven, late 60s or early 70s, but there was a missing persons case, uh, I think it was a child, and it was in one of the national parks and the Green Berets were called in. The one of the, you know, most badass special forces units in history. Uh, you know, guys who obviously are trained for mountain and forest terrain and rescue operations,
but that's a little overkill. You know, these are the guys who were getting sent into villages in Vietnam to do demolitions in the dead of night. You know, these are these are the the best of the best when it comes to the Army Special Forces, especially at the time. So why the hell did the U.S. government call in Green Berets for a, a search and rescue operation in a national park? That doesn't make a ton of sense. And, and it's kind of after that incident where things start to clamp down a little bit more. So you've got all, this, all these really strange occurrences um, surrounding our national parks. And, you know, again, call me, call me crazy, but when the government won't give you information on things, that's a good, good indicator that something, something very strange is going on. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, that is the gist of my theory on this, about how the National Park Service was created by Teddy Roosevelt to control a rampant uh, Wendigo problem throughout the United States. And, uh, you know, discuss that in the comments. Let me know what you think. If you have any personal encounters with these kinds of creatures, I would love to hear about them. I'll, I'll read them if you want. I'll share them on my, my YouTube, my TikTok, my Instagram, all that. I think this is an incredibly interesting topic. I... Uh, and I am always happy to discuss. I'm happy to have a conversation. And, you know, to, to use this this weird little uh, 15 minutes of fame that I found to, to highlight this issue for, for people who are interested in, uh, in you know, in the subject. Uh, and that, that does not, I don't want to limit that the, to the U.S. and Canada. Uh, if you're from Mexico, if you're from South America, the, the U.K., Russia, uh, you know, any, anywhere in the world that has these weird phenomena, phenomena anywhere in the world that has these weird disappearances these occurrences that have to do with some sort of superhuman creature abducting people you know right from under the noses of their friends uh you know whether whether it's in yosemite or in mexico in uh you know the, the dyatlov pass incident whatever it is you know i would love to hear about it i would i would love to do videos on it you know i find this interesting i I will happily spend time researching it. If, if this is something that people want in, in, out in the world, I'm happy to do it. So if you like this video, uh, you know, like, subscribe. Uh, you know, if you've got your own stories, let me know. And I, I, I hope to see you next time.